Welcome to the finale of these fully detailed Zero no Kisuki story summaries. We'll begin right where we left off with the aftermath of the Mafia Raid. Here begins the beginning of the end of Zero's story with the longest day in Crossbell's history. Now let's dive right in. The morning after the attack begins like any other, until Yona phones Lloyd. The news of the raid has the SSS heading off to investigate the aftermath. Arios and the other bracers are also discussing ways to deal with the tense situation. Officer Franz greets them right outside the ruins of the Heiyue building. Apparently, Detective Dudley and the 1st Crime Division are already interrogating Cow upstairs. The first couple floors of the building are absolutely wrecked, though the top floor oddly shows no signs of damage. Detective Dudley's inquiry only gets superficial pleasantries from Cow. The fact that the Heiyue branch manager is willing to entertain the SSS over the first division has Dudley swallowing his pride and leaving the information gathering to Lloyd. Lloyd gets straight to the point and asks Cow what's the next plan for the Heiyue. His bold inquiry amuses Cow, so he humors the SSS and proceeds to answer. It's confirmed that the assailants last night were from Rivace, though the Killing Bear and his former Jaeger comrades did not participate in the raid. Randy finds it odd that the Heiyue fell so hard if their combat prowess is said to be basically equal to Rivace. It appears that while the fighting technique of Rivace remained the same, their strength, speed, and durability was out of this world. It's a no-brainer that the Heiyue will retaliate against all those who threaten their profits and standing. Since they still need intel on Rivace's new power, they've asked Yin to conduct a discreet investigation. It's also confirmed that the Heiyue have no knowledge of Kia besides the fact that the SSS rescued her from the auction. The only information they received beforehand is from a source they could not even identify, and it was only the mention about a bomb that would destroy Rivace. Finally, Kao admits to Lloyd that he hasn't felt this excited to plan and execute a full-scale operation in years. However, he's willing to give the SSS special consideration and time to figure out a solution to this escalating mafia war before the Heiyue goes all out. The four have a quick debrief outside. Since Kao has given them time before he launches a full-scale assault, they need to conduct an efficient investigation. Lloyd is most curious about Garcia's absent role in this. He has shown himself to only act with purpose and has demonstrated great command over his subordinates, so they need to confirm whether he ordered the raid. With that, the SSS heads over to Rivace headquarters. More guards than usual are seen stationed outside the building. Tio is able to pick up a complex mess of feelings from them, ranging from great anger, excitement, and anxiety. They definitely appear to be vigilantly guarding against any retaliation by the Heiyue. Unfortunately, this means that it's too dangerous for the four to approach now. However, as if right on cue, Garcia strolls up from behind them. He is willing to answer one question. Due to his Jaeger days, he was trained to never stage an attack with just sheer brute force. The Jaeger way is to wait for a favorable opportunity that would result in the least amount of casualties. This news confirms that Garcia did not order the raid. Both Tio and Lloyd comment that although the whole of Ravache appears stronger, they appear tired somehow. Reporter Grace approaches and says she has some info that would interest them. The four take her up on the offer and meet in the jazz bar. She agrees to disclose all the info she has on Rivace in exchange for the info that Lloyd got from Cow earlier that morning. She's picked up on the rumor that Garcia's control of his subordinates is slipping. These recent violent actions taken by Rivace seem to be instigated by some opportunistic younger members. As for Rivace's president, he is currently desperate to correct Rivace's massive blunder at the auction. He's currently meeting with many other political leaders in Crossbell, including the CGF commander, and even those from the Republican faction. He's trying to expand Rivace's influence while suppressing the Heiyue's opportunities all the while. Lloyd brings up how they just don't seem to be working together as an organization right now. Recent actions appear haphazardly planned out, 
Just then, Lloyd receives a call from the Mines Village mayor. Mr. Gantz has been causing a violent uproar at the casino, so the SSS head over right away with Grace in tow. Mayor Bixen points them to a private room once they arrive. They find Mr. Gantz in a poker match against Lecter of all people. Gantz has just laid out a straight flush, confident that he has finally broken their streak of ties. Unbelievably, Lecter's hand consists of five of a kind with four aces and the Joker since they're playing with wild cards. Utterly defeated, Mr. Gantz accuses Lecter of cheating. The owner must be an accomplice as well since there's no way Gantz could have lost. He has the best luck and intuition in the world. In blind rage, he forcibly grabs the owner and throws him against the wall. Lloyd and Mayor Bixen barge in and physically restrain Mr. Gantz before he can attack Lecter. The former miner throws an adult tantrum before finally passing out from exhaustion. It took all of Lloyd and Randy's strength to restrain him for the entire duration before he passed out. The mayor can't believe how Mr. Gantz is acting, since he was a good-natured individual back in Mind's village. Grace wonders if he's been taking some strange drugs. Though the mayor fears for Mr. Gantz's reputation and would rather not entertain the idea that he's taking these dangerous substances. But the SSS are able to convince him that checking for drugs is vital to Gantz's safety. Lloyd finds some strange blue pills inside the man's breast pocket. Tio's reaction is oddly quiet, though no one seems to notice. Strangely enough, according to reporter Grace, illegal drugs are rarely found in Crossbell despite the prevalence of the Mafia. Lloyd notices Tio's silence as they inspect the drugs again, but she says she must be imagining things. For now, they plan to report everything they've learned to Chief Sergei. Before they leave, Grace says they've grown a lot in just four short months, so much so that she's really expecting great things from the four. She can't help but see Guy's legacy living on through them. Grace would know since Lloyd's older brother helped jumpstart her career at the Crossbell News all those years ago. Chief Sergei suspects that all the recent cases are connected. Lloyd deduces that Rivace's new strength and the sudden increased abilities of Mr. Gantz are linked to the blue pills. Rivace is probably distributing these drugs to the civilians. The man that lawyer Ian brought up the other night is likely just another example of the pills' effects. Lloyd worries that the SSS will soon be unable to handle this major situation alone, especially since the first crime division is officially responsible for illegal substances. The conversation shifts right on time as Detective Dudley of all people enters Sergei's office. Dudley was planning on only cooperating with the chief at first, but he's ultimately convinced to hear the special support section out. On his end, it turns out that the 1st Crime Division has been ordered to direct all efforts towards Mafia suppression. Because of this, they're unable to continue their current investigation into these drugs. Though as of now, Detective Dudley suspects all the rumors behind this drug that can grant your wishes to be just urban legend. That's why he's so shocked when Lloyd shows him the very pills themselves. Coming to understand the reality of the situation, Dudley admits that someone in the police top brass was bribed by the Mafia to give this new order to the first crime division. Dudley can't stand how cowardly the police has become and has no choice but to rely on the SSS to continue the drug investigation in his division stead. Chief Sergei announces that the SSS is now working unofficially with the first crime division and that in exchange for information on the drugs, Detective Dudley will provide intel on the Mafia's movements. The next plan of action is for the SSS to have Dr. Joachim analyze the mystery drug. Finally, Detective Dudley, in his very tsundere way, tells the four to be careful in their investigation. Fortunately, the hospital receptionist puts Dr. Joachim, who was planning to go fishing again, 
right in his place. He still suggests that they bring Kia in for exams, but she just doesn't feel like it. They present the blue pills to the doctor, hoping that he's seen them somewhere before, though unfortunately he's unfamiliar with the drug despite having worked with pharmaceutical makers from every country. The increased human ability due to the medicine is something he's never personally encountered either. He keeps three of the pills in order to run them through a thorough ingredient analysis. He hopes to be finished with the test by the end of the day at the latest. While the SSS talk among themselves, Dr. Joachim remembers a strange rumor that was going around the pharmaceutical industry a couple years prior. A fanatic religious cult that was devoted to worshipping demons while rejecting the goddess had developed a new drug. By borrowing the strength of demons, the drugs awakened the latent potential in anyone who took them. Appearing to be quite bothered by this news, Tio finally asked Dr. Joachim if he heard what the drug was called. It was called Gnosis, named for true wisdom. Tio reels from the term, while the doctor wonders if there's some connection to the cult and the mysterious organization that had a hand in the liberal disaster the year before. In any case, Dr. Joachim will conduct the tests and consult with his colleagues, so the four will just have to sit tight and wait. Tio is still incredibly quiet as the four begin to head back to the city. The three finally ask what's up as they're waiting for the bus. Ellie notices that she's incredibly pale right before the younger girl collapses. Randy rushes to get help, then the scene cuts to Tio resting in Cecil's room. Cecil has the night shift so the four can rest as long as they want in her quarters. Once she leaves, Tio tells the other three that they can ask her anything about Gnosis. They are relieved that she's awakened, though she tells them not to worry too much about her. But though the investigation is important, the others don't want to question Tio about it if it's going to cause her pain. Randy especially upholds her right to keep quiet if she doesn't wish to talk about it, since he too has a lot hidden away regarding his past. But if sharing her story with them will help ease her burden, they're more than ready to give her their full support. Moved by her friend's honest care, she begins her story. It turns out that she was abducted five years ago by that crazy cult Dr. Joachim was talking about. The kidnapped children were used as offerings in strange ceremonies at various lodges across Zemuria. As for the site Tio was taken to, the cult leaders engaged in live human experimentation. The children were force-fed drugs and had sensors placed all over their bodies. Every abhorrent method imaginable was used to try and push the five human senses to their maximum potential. They induce the children with hypnosis, resulting in severe mental trauma that strengthened their sensing of the supernatural. Tio was trapped in that horrid place for three long years, but despite her suffering, she considers herself the luckiest one, since she was the only child able to withstand all the experimentation. One by one, the other children disappeared, until finally, she was the only one left standing. It was then that she obtained her sensory ability to hear the final desperate cries of the children trapped on the other side of a stone wall. Right at that moment, Guy and the rest of his team stormed into the lodge and staged their assault. The resistance by the cult members was fierce, and the rest of the leaders committed suicide before the lodge was completely suppressed. Guy passed many corpses until he finally reached the ceremonial chamber where Tio was held. She was taken to the hospital to undergo an intense recovery, and the rest is as she's already told Lloyd before. What worries her is the fact that, even after hearing of Guy's passing, she wasn't very sad. Has she lost her human emotions in exchange for her sensory powers? She wanted to ask Guy, a person radiating positivity, how a broken existence like her should go on living. But she never got the chance before he died. So for what purpose is she still alive? Ellie gathers Tio in a warm embrace, saying it's okay that she doesn't know. Lloyd says that, in reality, there are very few people out there who have an answer to that question. 
He, Ellie, and Randy don't have an answer themselves. There's no need to rush finding an answer. The entire special support section can all continue searching together. Tio can't believe how much Lloyd has brushed off on Ellie and Randy. The genuine heartfelt message is cheesy and rather embarrassing, but it touches Tio's core and brings her to tears. After all the feels are shared, they head back to the city. Tio gets some rest, complete with snuggles from Kia. Meanwhile, Lloyd, Randy, and Ellie hear all about the major operation to suppress the cult lodges a number of years ago. At the time, Chief Sergei was the direct superior of two incredibly promising young rookies of the CSPD, one whom was Lloyd's brother Guy, the other was Arios McLean of all people. They both had incredibly contrasting personalities. Guy was boisterous and wild, while Arios was the serious and diligent type. This actually served their partnership well though, since their work styles complemented each other. So much so that they became known as the CSPD's strongest duo. They were the pride of Chief Sergei and, altogether, were an incredibly successful division. Because of their great prowess, they were eventually entrusted with a major international operation involving the DG cult. Though they're still unsure what the entire name symbolizes to this day, they know that the G stands for Gnosis. Six years ago, the cult had over 10 lodges scattered all throughout Zemuria. They sacrificed dozens of children in their experiments, were in illegal possession of artifacts, and summoned hordes of demons. The one thing that remained constant across the various lodges was the use of the drug Gnosis. An international body consisting of each country's military, police, and bracer forces was called together to put an end to the cult. Notice from the bottom left in counterclockwise order, Guy, Sergei, Arios, Cassius Bright, and Zin Vathek. Sergei's group was charged with suppressing the lodge on the western border of Calvard near Altair City. This was where Guy rescued an 8-year-old Tio. The entire international operation was successful, and it was believed that the remaining cult members committed suicide or had a mental breakdown and died. For these reasons, it's incredibly troubling that this blue pill has resurfaced somehow. The chief brings up how they were never able to determine Guy's murderer to this day, though it could be any number of powerful organizations, ranging from Revache to the Society to the Jaeger Corps. Sergei still wonders if it could have been a surviving remnant of the cult. Due to the situation, Sergei is finally directly butting in as an active special support section member in order to avenge his former subordinate. Sergei's idea for the special support section came from Guy after all. Lloyd's brother thought a division like this could inspire and raise up the young talents of the CSPD so that eventually they could overcome any barrier. Tio likely joined the SSS since it's a place where Guy's will still lives on. Furthermore, it's beginning to look like Kia could be connected to the cult somehow. Lloyd actually convinces the chief to remain on standby as their commander so that he can protect Kia while they go and investigate the drugs. Tio is feeling much better in the morning thanks to Kia and a good night's rest. Since it would pose a danger to all of them if Tio were to collapse again, especially during combat, they agree to share their burdens freely and support one another. The first matter of business is to interrogate all the civilians who are suspected to have access to Gnosis based on the first crime division's reports. Before they leave, Mayor Bixen gives them an urgent call. Mr. Gantz has disappeared. When the mayor woke up that morning, Gantz was nowhere to be found. No one at the hotel or the casino has seen him. Lloyd calmly tells him to remain on standby at the hotel since the SSS is currently investigating the situation right now. Everything seems to be escalating much more quickly than expected. 
First up is the Saber Vipers hangout. They catch the tail end of the conversation between Wald and one of the other members. It appears that Dino, the young boy who used to guard the entrance to their warehouse, has disappeared. They don't get any answers from Wald, but Wazi approaches with some interesting news as they are leaving. They follow him to Trinity, where they learn that Dino challenged Wald to a one-on-one -on -one fight the day before. Incredibly, he was able to match Wald's strength and speed, though the leader was able to scrape out the victory in the end. Dino rushed out right after the match and hasn't been seen since. Speaking to the Bracers reveals that Rivace has been seen at Belgard Gate more frequently lately. There are rumors of further bribes made to the CGF commander. There's even more ominous news when they consult with Mr. Grimwood. He hasn't been able to get in contact with the businessman he's been following since the day before. Both the businessman's family and his company have no clue about his whereabouts. Mr. Bond from the residential district and Mr. Nichols from the Arkansas have also gone missing. Risha and Ilya comment that Mr. Nichols was displaying a great but near frenzied performance. Though it was outstanding, his acting just didn't appear natural. The four exit the theater with worry. Each of the five people listed have completely disappeared. Lloyd suddenly receives a call from an impatient Detective Dudley. He's really hoping they didn't stick their noses too far into Rivace. Lloyd asks if there's a problem, and Dudley says something odd about the building before catching himself and telling them to continue along with their current investigation. He then abruptly hangs up, which only spurs the four to head to Rivace's headquarters. Oddly enough, not a single guard is posted outside. Adding to this is the fact that Tio can't sense any human presence coming from inside the building, aside for one person, who must be Dudley. It's even stranger that Detective Dudley is so shocked to find the building completely empty. Since the first crime division was keeping track of the Mafia's movements, shouldn't they be aware of this already? It turns out that a bomb threat at the Crossbell Airport was sent in the night before. The CSPD top brass moved all who were on Mafia surveillance to this new threat. As further insult to the 1st Crime Division's pride, they can't even confirm how accurate this bomb threat is. Investigating the building with no search warrant will surely invite the wrath of the Mafia if they are discovered. But considering how dire the situation has become now that so many have gone missing and the pills having been linked to the DG cult, Lloyd can't just idly sit by. He asks Detective Dudley if he would turn a blind eye to the search he's about to conduct. Lloyd's headstrong attitude reminds Dudley of Guy. Detective Dudley assumes full responsibility of the investigation and orders the SSS not to fall behind. In the main reception room, they find some kind of panel behind a large picture. They'll have to find two particular keys in order to unlock it. The room to the left contains a gated entrance that requires a password to unlock. Randy just happens to find a note with a hint to the password in a saucy magazine upstairs. They figure out the riddle and unlock the gate. Inside is a huge warehouse filled with smuggled goods, complete with illegally collected monsters from foreign lands. The cops are immediately attacked on arrival, and fighting different monsters from Liberal along the way, they finally obtain one of the two keys. On the top floor, they must find an object with a specific weight to place in the bookshelf. Doing so brings the wall down and unlocks a secret passageway. The next area is apparently Rivace's armory. Dangerous electrical traps and even archaisms are scattered throughout. Tio is shocked by the existence of the archaisms since even the Epstein Foundation has yet to figure out how to develop this kind of machinery. Only that rumored society they heard about from Estelle and Joshua has the technology. Detective Dudley is none too happy to find that the rumors about archaism spreading in the underworld has turned out to be true. They find the second key at the end and take it back to the reception room. The two keys unlock the panel and reveal a secret underground passageway. 
Once downstairs, a large archaism, capable of human speech, suddenly appears out of thin air and blocks their path. It serves as a tough opponent, but they're able to bring it down. Knowing that Rivace had this kind of technology, it's a great wonder and fortune that it was never used in the Mafia raids. They finally reach President Marconi's private room. Everyone splits up to conduct a thorough search. As expected, they uncover basically every secret to Rivace's black market schemes, though unfortunately none of this can be used against them. Lloyd finds a key to a treasure chest and finds information on Gnosis inside, though the most surprising find is a CSPD officer's badge that's been badly scraped in the middle, aka Guy's badge. The reports on Gnosis confirm the names of all the Crossbell citizens who have received the drug. The source must be an old cult member who happens to be an old acquaintance of President Marconi. This person must be living somewhere in Crossbell, otherwise such frequency of correspondence wouldn't be possible. Tio comments that this cult member must have improved the Gnosis drug from years ago so that he can now supply ample amounts to the mob. The big dilemma now is how to deal with this current situation. The notes confirm that the CSPD's top chief has been bought by Rivace, so it's no wonder that the police's hands are tied right now. With no other options, Lloyd suggests contacting the Bracers for help. Detective Dudley is hesitant since it would expose the corruption within the CSPD, but Lloyd responds that they have a duty to act now that they have uncovered this information. The unsavory secrets of the police are a burden the entire CSPD will have to bear in order to prioritize the citizens' safety. This is no longer a time to be worried about pride or honor. Dudley is convinced, so he agrees to leave them in charge of contacting the Bracers. In the meantime, he will covertly go against the police higher-ups and do his best to enlist the 1st and 2nd Crime Division forces. He finally addresses Guy's badge, since those two became co-workers after Guy was moved to the 1st Division. At the time, they didn't get along since Guy was so different from the other detectives. He was too reckless and conducted investigations as he wished. However, everyone, including Dudley, acknowledged that he was truly an incredible detective. Each member of the 1st Division felt a great sense of loss when Guy was killed in the line of duty. They all did their best to find a single lead on Guy's murderer, but could uncover nothing. Dudley apologizes to Lloyd for bringing up painful memories, but the latter is just happy to hear the older man speak fondly of Guy. Dudley's just glad that Lloyd has a chance to settle the score and avenge his brother's death, but the younger man admirably puts that aside for the moment to focus on the bigger picture. So instead, Detective Dudley orders them all to carry out the next plan of action in honor of Guy's memory. This brings Chapter 4 to a close. Ren is seen at the Rosenberg doll studio. Regarding the SSS and Estelle and Joshua, she wonders which group will reach the big bad first. The doll maker, Meister Jorg, makes his first appearance. Although he's connected to Ouroboros, he has no idea what the Mafia and cult are truly planning. The Meister and Ren speak cryptically about the society and Crossbell. In fact, it serves as a truly significant buffer zone in more ways than one, not only between the two major empires, but between Ouroboros and the Church. The Pope keeps the Grawls Ritter away, while the Grand Master doesn't send in enforcers. Meister Jorg is responsible for creating a system that connects to Crossbell's orbital network, despite there being no official cable running to his studio. He's happy that it's helpful to Ren, though he was tempted to destroy it when the sixth Anguis, Professor Novartis, showed up at the studio again. He's also less than happy that his new prototype model was wrecked in battle. Overall, the Meister just doesn't get along with the Six Anguis at all. 
It appears that the repairs to Potter Modder are almost complete, so everything is set for the final gamble. Ren thanks Maester Yorg for everything he's done for her, but he's happy to do it for Ren. She turns to Potter Modder and says they should enjoy a long afternoon tea break, since today will likely be the longest day in Crossbell State's history. At 3 p.m., the SSS is seen relaying info to Arios and Michelle. Though all the cult lodges were successfully suppressed all those years ago, it's not out of the question that some of the leaders survived if underground criminal organizations were willing to shelter them. The top priority is to find the missing people. Michelle heads off to contact the bracers who are free, leaving Lloyd an opportunity to ask Arios about the time when he still worked for the CSPD. Back when it was Chief Sergei, Guy, and himself working as one team, they were regarded as the most accomplished and successful branch in police history, even ranking above the distinguished First Crime Division. But five years ago, Arios left for personal reasons and the team was disbanded. Sergei was transferred to the police academy, and Guy joined the First Crime Division until his death two years ago. Arios left the police with determination, but he still remembers those early days spent with a quirky boss and an amazing partner. In some ways, he's actually jealous of the special support section's proximity to each other, but overall, the Bracers and police have their own ways of pursuing justice. Bracers do so as a universal ideal, unbending to any political power, while the police do so, even when having to consider difficult political hurdles. Guy was chasing after that dream, and Chief Sergei has worked so hard to establish the special support section in an effort to realize that ideal. Lloyd and the others should continue what they are doing and find their own answers to pursuing justice. Estelle and Joshua return from a fun day out with Shizuku in tow. In the guild lobby, the four take Shizuku into their care. Ariosa's daughter wishes the Bracers luck and safety, while the Bracers tell the SSS to entrust the missing persons case to them. The four of them should focus on that call from Dr. Joachim and any information that can be found out about that drug. Outside, the four are amazed that so many B-rank and higher bracers are taking part in this mission. Shizuku knows that, in the past, her father used to work for the police. She's aware that it's complicated, but she's happy to see the bracers and police cooperating for this mission. The great news is that, in the meantime, Shizuku and Kia can play together. The five of them then return to the special support section building. Hours pass and the sun begins to set. It's now 5 p.m. and they still haven't received a call from the doctor. Chief Sergei takes over as contact with the guild and tells them to head over to the hospital to get the test results directly. Strangely enough, there's a long line at the bus stop even though the last bus should have left just 5 minutes earlier. A man in line says he's been waiting for the past 20 minutes, yet not a single bus has shown up. Just then, Detective Dudley gives Lloyd a call. The top brass of the CSPD are finally beginning to panic after hearing about Rivace's complete disappearance. And, as expected, the bomb threat turned out to be a complete fake. Though things seem to be turning around, it'll be a while before Dudley and his forces can act. He's not happy to hear that they still haven't heard back from the doctor. Dudley asks them to clarify which doctor this is, then grows suspicious when it turns out to be Dr. Joachim. Remember Secretary Ernest and how he was diagnosed as mentally unstable during his interrogation? Apparently, Dr. Joachim was his attending physician and counselor. Secretary Ernest's inhuman capabilities from back then are oddly reminiscent of all that's been going on recently. Ellie gives the hospital reception a call, but no one picks up. Too many suspicious coincidences are cropping up, leaving the SSS with no choice but to head to the hospital immediately on foot. They come across the bus parked haphazardly on the side of the road. Many belongings have been left behind in an otherwise empty vehicle. 
Lloyd contacts Chief Sergei immediately, who contacts the Tangram Gate to get backup from Vice Commander Sonia. They finally reach the entrance to the medical college at 6.50 p.m. The gates are closed and not a single light is on inside the entire building. They are suddenly caught in a pincer attack by some Vrvace members and their war dogs. After a tough battle, it appears that the Mafia goons are finally down for the count. But Tio notices that she feels no sense of human emotion from them. Just like her time in the cult lodge, the Mafia members growl and get right back up, surrounded by a strange purple aura. Suddenly, two needles pierce the men as Yin appears beside Lloyd and the others. The Mafia goons are not dead. He only used acupuncture to cut off their chi flow, which will ensure that they remain unconscious for a while. He's here on Cal's request, though he didn't expect Gnosis to be an actual drug. Tio wonders where the hey we have heard of it, but Yin only knows about as much as the SSS does. Because it is a complete state of emergency, Lloyd asks if Yin would cooperate with them for the time being. Yin agrees, though states that he'll move on if the four of them become a hindrance. The priority is to check on the safety of the people here and get information on the situation from them. They enter the cafeteria first and find two Mafia goons on guard inside. Once they're knocked out, Tio notices how she felt no human emotion from them either. It's highly likely that they are being completely controlled by the drug and are unable to think for themselves. Yin confirms that such puppeteering techniques through drugs and hypnosis exist in the East. They move further into the dormitories and find the kidnapped bus passengers. The bus driver tried to resist and was shot, while the rest of the passengers were held at gunpoint and were forced to walk all the way to the hospital. Lloyd tells them to stay put for now, and the SSS head to the next room. Here they find the head nurse and the injured bus driver and hospital security guard. Nurse Martha confirms that the other hospital staff and patients should still be in the main building. Lloyd and the others leave the care of the injured patients in the nurse's hands, then continue upstairs. They encounter some more Ravache goons and confirm the safety of some of the other nurses. They pick up a key to the main building and finally proceed to the main lobby. They enter to find it completely empty. Yin and Tio sense the presence of many people scattered throughout the building though. The party confirms the safety of various staff members and patients, encountering a number of Mafia goons and war dogs all along the way. In a private room on the third floor, they find intern Litton and Nurse Philia tending to the injured janitor. They relay some troubling news. Nurse Cecil and her patient, Mihail, were supposed to be in room 301, but it was empty when Lloyd and the others checked. The party finds Congressman Guevara of the Imperial Faction in a storage room along the way. Apparently, he was initially admitted to the hospital on a feigned illness. He makes the situation all about himself, thinking that Congressman Hartman has sent the Mafia to eliminate him. He pleads with Lloyd and the others to take him with them, but they don't have time for him right now. He's asked to go back to his room, but he continues to make a fuss, prompting Yin to bluntly state that he's too annoying. The assassin even asks if he can put the congressman to sleep, but there's unfortunately no time for teasing the pitiful man. He finally heads back to his room. They reach the rooftop and witness Cecil and her young patient surrounded by hideous monsters. Cecil begins to say her internal goodbyes to her loved ones as she prepares to shield the kid with her own body. Fortunately, Lloyd and the others draw the attention of the monsters just in time. The creatures are repelled to Lloyd's utter relief, since there's no way he could apologize to his brother if they fail to save Cecil and her patient. Young Mihail is carried back to his room where he can rest. Cecil finds it hard to believe that Dr. Joachim is a suspected culprit, and has no idea if he is still alive in the research building. He may have already escaped and left the other researchers behind. They also wonder where those eerie monsters came from, and Cecil responds that they just suddenly appeared from the research building. It must be hiding something, so they quickly proceed onwards. They enter the building and find a strange mist encompassing the entire premises. Tio senses that it doesn't affect the physical body, but the soul, while Yin confirms it seems to be some strange spiritual miasma. Fighting various creepy monsters along the way, they come across some professors who throw dangerous chemicals at them as soon as they enter the room. Thankfully, they all dodge it in time, as the professors come out of hiding and awkwardly apologize for acting so rashly. 
The party escorts the researchers safely back to the main hospital area. It turns out none of them have seen Dr. Joachim. They also share some eerie information that the monsters just suddenly appeared in the research building. Not a single soul from the Mafia has been seen in the building, and no one saw the monsters actually enter through the doors. One of the professors did see a man, who was not in Ravache's black attire, with the monsters though. He was seen heading to the fourth floor. Searching the entire building finally scores them an authentication card that can unlock the elevator. They take the elevator to the top floor and are unexpectedly reunited with Secretary Ernest, who has been awaiting their arrival. His eyes are a creepy red since he's completely given over to his demonization. Yin doesn't take kindly to meeting him since the secretary assumed the name of the legendary assassin all those months ago. The biggest elephant in the room, however, is the fact that he was able to escape prison. Located at the Belgard Gate, it looks like the corrupt connections to the CGF commander have come in handy for prisoners. Contrary to Randy's assumption, though, it hasn't fallen into the hands of the Mafia. Actually, Ravache was a mere pawn of Ernest and his co-conspirators' plans. Under the leadership of the Great Comrade, they were able to control all the mobsters who took the Gnosis. Before anything else can be confirmed, Ernest draws his sword and surrounds himself in an eerie purple glow. Two demonic creatures are summoned next to him, and the three higher elements make an appearance. He'll answer their questions if they're able to defeat him, a being who has mastered Gnosis. The party eventually bests him, but he's not worried. Ellie wonders what has happened to him that he sinks so low, but he just responds that he's been enlightened to the truth about Crossbell. Lloyd makes to arrest him, but Ernest says he shouldn't be so hasty. His comrade has planned much more for this night. In fact, their invitations are on the desk. Ernest says they'll meet again, then leaps from the window. He catches a ride on an ancient wyvern-like creature that the SSS first encountered at Stargaze Tower. Since there's nothing they can do, they head over to the contents on the desk. Inside are records of the cult's experiments, with particular emphasis on the lodge called Paradise, the very same place where Wren was held. Chairman Hartman is listed as one of the main co-conspirators. Furthermore, it appears that the main manufacturing site of the drug is not at this hospital, but somewhere else. The other notebook contains pictures and files of all the child test subjects from the various lodges. They find a picture of young Tio, who tearfully adds that she looks much healthier now than that time. A picture of young Ren is also found, confirming their suspicions regarding her background. Finally, a picture of Kia trapped inside an orb is found on the very final page. How despicable that he'd suggested running tests on her with a straight face. They hear a girl's voice and turn to find Ren sitting on the windowsill. She finally introduces herself for real as an Ouroboros Enforcer number 15, the Angel of Slaughter. Yin recalls facing Walter the Direwolf at one point, and Ren responds that perhaps she should have asked him to come with her. She actually finds it strange that someone like Yin hasn't been scouted by the society yet. Ultimately though, she got what she came for. She wished to confirm the identity of Joachim Gunter, a remnant of the DG cult who completed Gnosis in secret. Patermater also has been fixed, meaning there's only one last reason why she still remains in Crossbell. Ren asks Lloyd to pass on a message to Estelle and Joshua, that she'll give them one final chance to catch her. Furthermore, she's merely observing what's going on here. She has no intention of helping the SSS or interfering with Joachim's plans. Finally, she warns them that Kia is likely the key to everything, so they better take care that she's not stolen from them. She bids them farewell and jumps from the window. The party is left astonished as they watch her fly away on Patermater. Lloyd's phone begins ringing, and it turns out to be the CGF Vice Commander Sonia on the other end. Her forces are just about to enter the hospital to secure the premises. Ian announces that he's leaving as they watch the CGF do their work. The assassin has a lot to report to Cal, but also unexpectedly announces he has something he needs to protect as well. He bids them farewell and takes off. The SSS rendezvous with Vice Commander Sonia and Sergeant Noel, but can't stay long since they still have Kia they need to protect. Commander Sonia has her hands full dealing with the Belgard prison break, so she commands Noel to escort Lloyd and company back to Crossbell City. Once they all leave, Cecil looks on, asking Guy to watch over Lloyd.
By 8.45 p.m., Lloyd and the others have filled in Detective Dudley and Chief Sergei on their findings regarding Joachim Gunter. They can't figure out why he would purposefully leave behind incriminating evidence, especially since it doesn't appear to be a diversion from a grander conspiracy. There's this business regarding Kia as well. What is it about her that's so important to his plans? It's looking like she holds the key to finishing what the cult started six years ago. Detective Dudley says they can't count on the police forces to handle this, since their hands are tied dealing with the attack on the prison and the police academy. Lloyd suggests that they ask the Bracer Guild to shelter Kia somewhere abroad. If Estelle, Joshua, and Arios are guarding her, they should be able to make it safely to Liberal, which is far from the cult's reach. Chief Sergei agrees that this is the best option, but asks Lloyd if he's okay with turning over Kia's protection to someone else. His response highlights how this is no time to be worried about his own pride. All he wants is for Kia to be safe. Dudley says they need to make a decision quickly, since the last international liner is scheduled to leave at 9.30 that night. The chief tells Lloyd to go ahead and contact the guild, but unfortunately, the bracers haven't returned from their mission yet. Right as they're still speaking, the loud sound of glass shattering is heard on Michelle's end. Large machine gun fire is heard before the line disconnects. Stunned, the others wonder if it was Rivace, but Lloyd can't help but notice something suspicious about the attack. The landline starts ringing with Sergeant Noel bringing dire news. All contact with the Belgard gate has been completely cut off. Her forces are currently trying to figure out what's going on, but they don't have any clear answers yet. After reporting about the attack on the guild in exchange, Lloyd and Noel wish each other luck, then hang up. Zeit starts growling at the door, and Tio translates it as completely surrounded. Watch out! Chief Sergei takes full command and orders Lloyd and Randy to take Kia and Shizuku, while Ellie and Tio provide the escort. The chief and Dudley will bring up the rear. Thankfully, the young girls are very calm about the situation. Then heavy artillery fire shreds through the wall. CGF forces appear and display the same menacing lack of awareness as the Rivace goons. The party escapes from the rear entrance and decides to head to police HQ. Armored vehicles approach and block any route through West Street, so they're forced through Central Square. More of the CGF block other routes, so they start heading for Back Street. Of course, all the citizens are wondering what the hell is going on. The Chief and Dudley provide more than adequate rear support, but are separated from the SSS. Ilya and Risha approach when they reach the Entertainment District, but are told to stay away from them. More CGF arrive and begin their pursuit, leaving Ilya in awe, since she believes this raid to be some kind of tourist attraction. The Chief and Dudley regroup with the party, then they all continue towards Police HQ. Ilya attempts to join in on the fun, but Risha drags her away to safety. CGF forces are seen surrounding the politicians from City Hall and attempting to break down the metal shutter to the CSPD building. With that option scratched, the party discreetly tries to head back towards Central Square. Meanwhile, Chairman Hartman appears bewildered and even worried that this was all just a trap set up by Yellowkin. Thankfully, the CGF is no longer in Central Square, so the chief makes the decision that they'll now go their separate ways. The SSS is to take the girls and escape from Crossbell through East Street. The forces that are attacking right now are from the Belgard Gate, so they should be able to trust Sonia's forces. They should contact Tangram Gate and request to be picked up after they reach the East Highway. The Chief and Dudley will provide the distraction so that they can get away. Kia wishes the Chief safety, then the SSS heads off as the two men make their stand. Along the way, Lloyd and company come across Guild receptionist Michelle, who's fortunately alright. They give him a brief update on what's going on with the CGF, then Michelle urges them to continue along towards the highway. The bracers should be returning soon and will be sent as backup as soon as possible. 
The group finally reaches some peace and quiet. However, Ellie is unable to get in contact with the Tangram Gate. She tries to contact Sergeant Noel, but is interrupted by Revache forces that approach from the highway. They're forced to deal with these thugs, but plenty more arrive. It appears they have no choice but to head back to the city, but then the CGF catches up. It's really not looking great as the combined forces completely surround the party, but a red vehicle appears right on time to save them. It turns out to be Maria Bell and Dieter's private limousine. The party jumps in and they all begin their escape from the scene. The Croys were just returning from the Republic when they were attacked by the Mafia. It's a good thing that the vehicle is completely bulletproof, courtesy of the Reinford Group. President Dieter plans to take them to the IBC building where they can catch their breath. The gate is made of a special alloy that cannot be broken down easily. Since he's the president of a major business in Crossbell, he shouldn't be apathetic to what's going on in the city. He wants to hear a detailed explanation of everything that's going on. Once brought up to speed, Dieter announces his disappointment in Crossbell and himself. He was aware of the political schemes involving the congressmen and the mafia, but he can't believe it's gone this far. Both Dieter and Mariabel believe that they share some responsibility due to their inaction and neutrality, especially since the IBC is a very influential voice. As of now, the main plan relies on the technology division and their efforts in restoring communications between the IBC, Police HQ, and the Tangram Gate. Regarding Kia, it's likely that the demonized forces are specifically pursuing her. Their attacks against the party outright avoid killing blows since they clearly want the young girl alive. Kia and Shizuku are resting together after the draining affair. Kia begins calling out to each member of the SSS during her sleep. It seems like she's dreaming of a very scary place right now. Lloyd comforts Kia with some gentle head pats, then thinks to himself how he finally understands, because of the situation, why he has returned to Crossbell City. After wandering around a bit, Lloyd finally gets a call from Dieter. He's just received a troubling report from the IBC guards, so he wishes to go over it with the four. An updated report comes in, announcing that the CGF is now installing a cylinder-type object near the gate. Due to his time in the Guardian Force, Randy immediately recognizes this as a major orbital bomb. Even the IBC's special alloy gates would be unable to withstand a blast from it. Lloyd and the others make the only decision possible in this moment. They will be holding off the CGF long enough for the technicians to jam the orbital bomb and for other reinforcements to arrive. They have the terrain and strategic advantage when placed right before the IBC gates. Right as they're heading out, Kia exits the room and asks where they're all going. She asks if she can come with them, while Shizuku also exits the room. Lloyd leaves the girls in Maria Bell's care, so she tells them to return to bed while she makes them some hot cocoa. Lloyd asks for the goddess's protection over them all as they descend in the elevator. Then they proceed with one of their toughest missions yet. Two of the CGF troops are caught by surprise when the gates suddenly open. The guards and Master Guillaume from downtown drag the bomb inside to dismantle it. The next wave of CGF troops arrive and are defeated, only for the next wave to approach immediately after. Each consecutive wave brings with it more troops, but the special support section's efforts don't go unnoticed by those watching from afar. Kao and his right-hand man are seen observing the efforts of the four. The Heiyue branch manager is impressed, since he initially judged the SSS as incapable of handling these attacks. If they fail here, it'll mean that that's all they've amounted to. Reporter Grace tells her panicked cameraman to get it together. As journalists, their only weapon is the pen and paper, so he needs to capture all the photos he can of this moment. She internally promises the four that she'll turn this into one amazing article, so they need to hang in there. Warrant Officer Mireille finally arrives with her men and gives the SSS a tough time. 
The fact that even she and her men were affected pisses off Randy. He uses the Jaeger war cry and powers up. Lecter is observing their battle from afar, though he ominously states that at this rate, everything will go according to Osborne's plans. He notices the last wave of CGF approaching and wishes them luck nonetheless. Unfortunately, this is a battle they can't win. Thoroughly spent and outnumbered, the SSS are brought to their knees. Randy's old co-worker, Loggins, approaches, though he's currently possessed by Joachim. If they want to know what he and the cult are planning so badly, they should just join his side. He offers them Gnosis, promising that they'll be able to attain the same level of enlightenment, though Tio won't stand to hear another word about it. Because of all the sacrifices, Joachim was able to piece together the ancient history of this land. He believes that fate brought the cult's efforts to this point, and he doesn't expect unenlightened individuals to understand. The one request he makes is that they return Master Kia to them. She initially served as their god's child, and now it's time to restore her to that position. Obviously pissed off, the SSS raise their weapons and threaten Joachim's forces, but before another unwinnable fight breaks out, Kia rushes out to shield the four. They shout at her to get back inside, but a strange blue glow begins to surround the young girl. She makes Joachim promise that he won't harm the SSS if she goes along with him, and he accepts. But Lloyd won't stand for it, especially since she shared how scared she is of those dark places. Kia's real feelings come out. She worries how she's just a burden to them, especially since she has no memories. But each of them responds how just spending time together with her and each other was more than enough. Zeit comes out to join them as well. Lloyd finishes by telling Kia not to leave them, and she finally agrees. Joachim realizes that entrusting her to them was a mistake. He really has it out for all of them now, but before he can finish them off, the heavy-hitting reinforcements arrive. Arios makes quick work of most of the CGF, and Dudley and Sergei eliminate those who are left, then apprehend the man Joachim is possessing. Unexpectedly, Wald and Wazi, along with their gangs, make up the remainder of the reinforcements. For a bunch of amateur street fighters, they do quite well in repelling the trained forces of the CGF. Finally, Fromm gives Lloyd a call, confirming that the communications with the police HQ and Bracer Guild have been repaired thanks to Yona and the IBC staff. Joachim's not worried about these additional reinforcements though, since his forces still equals the strength of 1,000 men. Additionally, the Gnosis provides an unlimited amount of stamina and eliminates their need for sleep. He manically laughs before leaving the body of the CGF officer. Estelle and Joshua apparently have been ascertaining Joachim's true location. They found a number of signs pointing to the missing people being taken to the ruins of the ancient battlefield. Getting to them won't be easy, unfortunately, since the Mafia's remaining forces are lining the East Highway, and the police cars to get there have been stolen by the CGF. Dieter shows up right on time and offers his bulletproof limousine. The older adults begin deciding who should go and who should stay behind, but the SSS say that they'll be the ones to go. Since Kia is the one and only target of the cult, their strongest fighters need to be defending this place. The chief butts in and states he's coming as well, since none of them can drive. They promise Kia they'll be back soon, so they can throw a big party to celebrate. Chief Sergei demonstrates his skills on the road, since he is the former driving instructor of the police academy. He expertly weaves through the Mafia blockade on the east side of the city and proceeds onwards. They don't run into any problems for a while, but then the CGF show up in hot pursuit. They fire missiles, causing Sergei to lose speed from having to swerve to avoid them. One of the armored vehicles pulls up to the side of the limo and fires heavy artillery that's able to pierce the bulletproof plating. The chief is hit, but he refuses to stop. 
It's the job of the older folks to pave the path for the youngsters. Tio senses that Sergeant Noel's lighter vehicle is catching up to assist them. She completely throws off one of the armored cars and keeps the other one busy. She connects to their radio and urges them to hurry on to the ruins. She'll take care of any remaining vehicles that are pursuing them. Now that the path is wide open, Sergei speeds along towards the ancient battlefield. Estelle and Joshua meet up with them outside the Temple of the Sun. They've finally gotten the entrance open to the ruin, and they've been waiting for Lloyd and the others to show up so they can begin the infiltration together. Lloyd relays Ren's message to the two bracers. Estelle sees that Ren is testing them to see if they'll really be able to accept everything about her. The final showdown with Joachim holds a lot of weight and closure for Ren, Tio, and Kia, so they need to put their best foot forward. The chief has patched his leg up, but uses his remaining energy to hobble out of the car. He needs to see his younger subordinates off on their big mission. He looks forward to the public validation the four SSS will receive once they take care of this case, so they absolutely must return. We arrive at a familiar scene from all the way back in the beginning of the game, except this time Estelle and Joshua are seen bringing up the rear. Blazing a path through various ancient monsters, they eventually reach a large stone door inscribed with the prototype eye symbol that the DG cult was inspired by. A large demon is summoned, and once it's defeated, they're allowed further entry into the ruins. The next part also mirrors one of the very first scenes of the game. The party observes a gaping pit exuding an ominous miasma. They descend further and further down the stairs and eventually reach a level that contains modern technology. This is most likely where Joachim developed the Gnosis to its current state. Two mobsters approach them, but Tio notices something strange about their eerie quiet. All of a sudden, they start screaming and begin releasing a purple glow. They horrifically turn into demonic creatures. Though fortunately, they turn back to their regular human forms after they are defeated. All in all though, the situation isn't looking good. The group presses on and finds various terminals scattered about which contain corrupted information of the cult's beliefs and Joachim's experiments. One terminal states that Gnosis is made from Pleroma grass, something that no one in the party, not even Tio, has heard of before. There's a lot of redacted info on Kia as well, but they're unable to recover it. Eventually, they come across a level that contains a river of eerie red liquid. It closely resembles blood, but Randy says it doesn't smell like it. Joshua believes it's probably the waste product from manufacturing the Gnosis. The party eventually finds all the missing people. They've all been locked up in these huge cells, but luckily the release lever is close by. Although they've been released, it's actually safer for them to remain on standby here until Sonia's CGF forces arrive. Lloyd and the others continue onwards and reach another hall of cells filled with President Marconi and other Rivace higher-ups. President Marconi blames the special support section for giving him no choice but to use the dangerous drugs on his men. This implies that Marconi was not a direct accomplice of Joachim, and it turns out that the Rivace president had no idea the drug did such horrific things like turning people into demons. Some of the other men ask Ideos to forgive them for falling so low, but Marconi tries to push the narrative that they're all just victims in this. Lloyd finally tells him to stop screwing around. Of course he bears the responsibility of this situation. Ellie also puts him in his place, saying there's no way any congressman can come to his aid this time since they've been implicated in Joachim's conspiracy. As for Garcia, apparently he tried to resist Joachim up to the very end, but was eventually overrun by demonic creatures. They haven't seen him since. Lloyd makes the tough decision of releasing the lock on the cell door, even if this gives the mob a potential chance to escape. Though of course, venturing out would be practically suicide, given all the tough creatures wandering around. 
Lloyd asks Marconi about Guy's CSPD badge. He learns that Guy was on their hit list, but before Rivace could take care of him, someone else beat them to the punch. Marconi and his men just happened to recover his badge from the scene of the crime. Furthermore, Guy was hot on Joachim's trail even all those years ago. Perhaps he invited Joachim's wrath during that time. But alas, the party must press on. Further along, they find their path blocked by Ernest. The punishment for his crimes will be much worse, since he's acting on his own accord unlike the possessed mafia and CGF. Ernest responds that laws are simply defined by the society that makes them. There's no reason for him to care once Crossbell becomes a new, holy ground. This time, Ernest undergoes a full demonic transformation and believes he has now surpassed humanity. The six of them defeat him again, and the former secretary regains his human form. Ellie is the one to confirm that he is unconscious, then internally bids her former tutor and family friend a final farewell. At last, it seems like they're reaching the end. Here they find the killing bear blocking their path. He has fallen to the same mind control as his subordinates. Unlike them though, he doesn't go through a full demonization. His Gnosis heightened combat abilities pose quite a threat to the party, however. Just when it seems like he's down, he begins to show signs of undergoing a demonic transformation. As a former Jaeger, Randy knows exactly how to speak to Garcia. He shouts that a Jaeger vet isn't so weak-minded. He screams at him to show him the same guts that earned him the name Killing Bear. The purple aura enveloping Garcia dissipates and he drops to one knee. He was able to return to his senses on sheer willpower alone. Despite the circumstances, he gives Randy his thanks. Joachim directly injected the Gnosis into Garcia's veins, but the most unforgivable aspect to him is the fact that his men were completely sabotaged by the deranged cult leader. Lloyd promises that they will arrest Joachim, so Garcia lays aside his distaste of the party and leaves the cultist's defeat to them. Then he passes out from exhaustion. They finally reach the end of this massive underground labyrinth. At the top of the altar lies the orb that was featured in the photo of Kia from the cult's files. Joachim descends the stairs in his cult robes and welcomes them to this holy ground. Estelle makes an aside to Joshua about how this guy is just as crazy as Wiseman, though Joshua believes the professor wasn't as fanatical as Joachim is. Joachim claims that Kia has always been the divine child that the cult has worshipped. In fact, she's not even from this current era. Prior to this past month, she has been sleeping in that orb for the past 500 years. Yes, half a millennia ago, a group of alchemists arrived in Crossbell to study ancient artifacts. This is the very same group from the Middle Ages who built the Stargaze Tower. They built this very altar, leaving Kia to an eternal slumber for all those centuries. This news is hard to take in, since the SSS was hoping to be able to recover her memories. But Joachim butts in saying Master Kia needs no past. She's about to become a true god, while Adios is just some imaginary figment created by the Septian Church. Joachim believes the DG cult is actually misunderstood. They don't actually worship demons, they've just learned to fight poison with poison. Tio uncharacteristically rushes forward and tells Joachim to shut his mouth. How could the cult possibly justify the horrific things they did to real people if they weren't actually demon worshippers? But unsurprisingly, Joachim fails to demonstrate a single shred of empathy. He only stands amazed that he's able to meet Tio, a former test subject with superb sensory capabilities. The purpose of all the cruel rituals at the lodges were for the sake of pushing Gnosis and human ability to its full potential. Young test subjects who were about to reach puberty worked best for this very reason. Another big question is how exactly was the CGF convinced to take the drug? It turns out that Joachim passed off Gnosis as a booster drink developed by St. Ursula Hospital. It's Estelle and Joshua's turn to ask questions now. 
Estelle demands info on the lodge called Paradise, and Joachim responds that the cult higher-ups set up that particular place and offered its services to bribe influential men. This vile lodge even violated Joachim's research principles. However, unlike the lodges that were destroyed by that international operation six years ago, Paradise faced annihilation years later by the society. He disgustingly laments how he wished he had the opportunity to collect data on the genius test subject that was able to imitate the personalities of the other children. Estelle cuts him off, saying she's heard everything she needs. The two bracers hand the convo back over to Lloyd, who lays out all the criminal charges that Joachim faces. The cult leader summons an ancient orbal staff that holds greater power than many artifacts. His hair also turns white. Apparently, this is its actual color, since the gnosis he's been taking for years had turned it blue. The drug is also responsible for his inability to sleep, which has allowed him the time to work both on gnosis and on the hospital staff equally for all those years. The party is then thrown into battle against Joachim and his summoned archaisms from the Middle Ages. It finally looks like they've cornered him, but he lets them in on the true effects of Gnosis. Not only does it enhance physical power, but other senses as well. He summons what appears to be the evil eye that Wiseman used back in Sky. Estelle and Joshua are stunned that he can do this, while Joachim comments that the two have had many interesting experiences, both on the Liber Arc and in Phantasma. It turns out that he's reading, and even recreating, their memories. His plan all along was to lure them all here so that Kia would eventually have no choice but to come and save them. Lloyd can't figure out why Joachim needs Kia if he's already so powerful, but of course, there would be no way for them all to understand just how much his power pales to Kia's. As for Guy's murderer, Joachim initially enlisted Ravache's forces to get rid of the detective, but some other third party got to him before. Lloyd only guessed as much. The detective also hits the nail on the head when he brings up how Kia's presence at the Schwartz auction can't have been planned by Joachim himself, since there's no way he would have given her up. There's some mastermind out there that even Joachim is unaware of, which pisses off the cult leader. Lloyd pushes his buttons even further by calling him and this Gnosis all a grand phony conspiracy. All Joachim is doing is just peering into memories and imitating the power he finds within. Lloyd's distractions work and grant him the exact opportunity to break the evil eye since it was just an incomplete mental imitation in the first place. Cornered, Joachim pulls out his trump card, a bottle of red pills. It's a more completed form of the blue gnosis, as the red pills are the ones that produce the demonic transformations. It really looks like bad news when Joachim downs the entire bottle in one go. The cult leader transforms into this horrific and massive demonic creature. Joshua even thinks this new threat is more powerful than the septarian-fused Wiseman. Transformed Joachim revels in his complete control and understanding of all living things. He can see their hidden intentions and the truth behind everything, including the trick behind Kia's disappearance, Guy Banning's death, and even the true inevitable fate of Crossbell. He then drags the party into the final battle of Zero Nakisaki. Each additional stage of demonized Joachim shows him growing increasingly more berserk. At last, the monstrous creature turns completely red as his flesh begins to disintegrate. He uses some technique that restrains them all, but this can't possibly be the end for them. Lloyd asks his brother to lend him strength, then a girl's voice cuts in. Ren isn't Guy, but she can lend them a hand. Potter Modder's cannons make quick work of the restraints, and now the rest is up to the party and their S-crafts. Joachim finally regains his own consciousness as he faces his imminent demise. He actually thanks the party for this, but pitifully, he still believes that even though he's failed, Master Kia will go on to achieve true greatness. 
The creature then completely dissipates into nothing. Even for someone as despicable as Joachim, the party laments the loss of a human life. The fact that he can no longer face true punishment for his crimes is a tragedy for all his victims. But Randy, Tio, and Ellie won't let Lloyd mope, especially since they ultimately succeeded in putting a stop to his vile schemes. Ren eventually chimes in. She wasn't planning to help, but it looks like Luve brushed off on her. She no longer has any regrets about Crossbell and prepares to leave, believing she's not ready to be caught. But Estelle says they've caught her already. The two bracers recall how long and hard they've tried to find Ren, and now that they know every single bit about her, all her sorrow and all her joy, they can finally meet her where she is at. The young girl tearfully admits that she thought they would give up once they found out about Paradise, and Estelle says that if she was the same girl she was two years ago, she may very well have given up. But going through everything in Liberal and Crossbell, she's become infinitely stronger. She understands that people's past shape who they are in the present, and that now she can't stop herself from loving Ren. Joshua wonders if it's best for the young girl to return to her real family. But even if that's so, he and Estelle want to make her part of their family no matter what. Potter Motter, the true MVP, begins walking towards the brights and lowers the girl as she screams at it to stop. Estelle finally gets to embrace Ren after all this time, and Joshua gives his thanks to Potter Motter and Meister Yorg for making it sentient. The three of them can finally return to Liberal where Tita has been waiting so long for Ren's return. At last, the young girl completely breaks down, and Estelle tearfully joins in as Ren returns her embrace. Lloyd and the others are truly touched at this happy conclusion. Joshua turns and asks how he could ever repay them for all their help, but Lloyd believes Estelle and Joshua did all the actual work with their own two hands. The SSS just offered support. He congratulates Joshua, then commands the SSS to escort the civilians as they return to the surface. The four are given a complete surprise in the form of Kia once they return to actual land. It's now morning and all the possessed CGF troops fainted once Joachim was defeated, giving everyone else who has helped a chance to rendezvous with the four. Though the initial danger has passed, it looks like everyone will be unbelievably busy in handling the aftermath. There are the Mafia arrests to deal with, the CGF will need to reconvene with all the troops who were affected by the Gnosis, and all of Crossbell's institutions are in for a major overhaul of their leadership. Not to mention the official story they'll have to present to all international bodies. Of course, Ario says the Bracer Guild will do all it can to help. Finally, Chief Sergei asks the SSS if they've settled everything in the dungeon underground, and they respond together with a resounding yes. Sergei knows that Guy would have been proud of them and their coming of age. Reporter Grace and her cameraman arrive on the scene and usher them all together for a group photo. After all the tensions between institutions and factions throughout the entire game, this final picture serves as a heartwarming testament to everyone's teamwork. Thus begins the response to this disaster. The Crossbell Times reports on this unprecedented major scandal between the DG cult, politicians, and other influential Crossbell leaders. Mayor McDowell dismissed the CGF commander and chief of police, and handed the full investigation over to Vice Commander Sonia. Many people were arrested, and the people's trust in Crossbell's institutions and leadership reached an all-time low. During this time, IBC President Dieter announced his candidacy as next mayor of Crossbell City. His campaign promises to uphold the ideals of Mayor McDowell. Special elections are planned for many seats in Congress as well. As for the next chairman, it's expected that individuals from all factions will be throwing their hat into the race. 
As for the special support section, they received special recognition by Mayor McDowell in City Hall for their invaluable contributions to solving the case. Estelle, Joshua, and Wren returned to Liberal. It left the Bracer Guild with less manpower, but the restructured CSPD is expected to fill in the gaps. Before the three left, though, Ren admitted that she had no idea why Kia was at the auction or who Guy's murderer could be. But that's fine, since finding the answer to those questions will be up to the special support section. After the mayoral elections, the SSS finally returned to their regular duties and normal life with Kia. The scene cuts to Kia's first day of Sunday school. Once again, Lloyd and Ellie can't help but be overly doting parents. As for the four, they're off to receive a new mission from the new mayor. Zero no Kisaki ends with the SSS and Kia waving to the camera and shouting the feel-good itakimasu, which basically means we're off. So what was your favorite scene or sequence of events from these final chapters of Zero? Thanks so much to February Knight for helping me out with this video, and thanks to you all for patiently waiting for this finale. Join Feb and my Discord to chat trails and whatever else, and follow us both on Twitter for updates on our content. The Ao no Kisaki story summaries will start up as soon as possible. So excited to begin covering my favorite game in the series next video. So until next time, take care. See ya.